Good afternoon, and welcome to this edition of Crack and the Bat, brought to you by the Irish American Baseball Society. Uh, the Irish American Baseball Society is a society for Irish people who love baseball and baseball people who love Ireland um, and all things Irish. And I am delighted uh, today to be joined by Jack Curry of the Yes Network, formerly of the uh, New York Times. Um, we're delighted that Jack will be here. And before I forget, Jack, by by graciously agreeing to do this, you automatically become a lifetime member of the Irish American Baseball Society. Um, I uh, thank you for the, taking time out of your busy schedule to uh, to spend some time with us. Well, first and foremost, Sean, it's great to see you again. It's been a while, but you are that baseball nomad who, when I would be wandering from ballpark to ballpark, I would always see Sean's smiling face. So to see it again via this vehicle is important. I want to thank John Fitz for having me on as well. I appreciate the invite. And though my mom left us in 1994, she so much loved her Irish heritage. For all of the interviews that I have done in my life, I know that this is one that she would have really gotten a kick out of. So so next to my Paul O'Neill book, I, I put a little picture of mom over here. So I just wanted to... Uh, Make sure that I that I honored her as we as we started talking some baseball here. That's awesome. Now, wh where was mom from? Well, she was born in the states, but her grandfather was from Cork. So, but my mother was. I, I know it's a it's probably a cliche, but on St. Patrick's Day, she would she would paint her hair green. She would wear every green article of clothing in her closet. And it, it was just clear how much that that heritage in her family, how much it meant to her and uh, Irish music in the house when we were growing up. So I I think of her in a moment like this because we're combining we're combining two of her loves. Now, on your father's side, I mean, believe it or not, Curry is is quite an Irish name. Um, yes. My father had uh, both English and Irish uh, heritage. And he didn't, uh, he didn't blare the horn about his heritage as much as my mom did, which is why I didn't mention him. But I, I guess I should have given dad a little love, too, as well. But he didn't talk about it and, and crow about it at the way that my mom did. Right. Uh, that when, when, whenever whenever I, I, I hear the name, I always my father has a great story. My father left uh, Ballycona, this tiny, tiny little town in Cavan in 1957 to go to London. And there were some people like friends of his parents uh, there who took him in when he got there first. So the first evening they got there, they said, oh, John, we're going out for dinner. We're going to have a curry. Do you want to join us? And my father said, you know, the only curry I know is Sonny Curry, who lived up the street. And he said, yeah, 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 I'll go. He said, he said his mouth was burnt off him, he says, for weeks, because obviously they didn't have uh, spices in Ballyconnell in, in the 50s. So grew up in Jersey. I grew up in Jersey City, Sean, is uh, a great place to grow up. I, uh, all of my best friends lived on the block that I lived on, and we played wiffle ball, we played stick ball. I had an older brother who introduced me to the game, and I wouldn't trade that, that upbringing for anything. I, th I think there was a toughness and a grit about having to grow up in the city. Almost every day there was something competitive that you were trying to do. And my love of baseball was was born at an early age. As I said, I had an older brother. So when I was five or six, he started throwing a ball to me and we started hitting a baseball. And I pretty much knew by the time I was 13 that I wanted to be a sports journalist. So all of that started on the streets of Jersey City. Uh, and if I if I remember correctly from the time of photos, you're still pretty tight with those guys that you grew up with, right? I, I am. Like anyone... You wish you could turn back the clock a little and, and have some of those fun days and schedules get in the way. We don't have to talk about how the pandemic got in the way, but absolutely. Uh, saw a couple of them recently, unfortunately, for, for a funeral, which unfortunately, uh, that's when we sometimes see people from our past. But yeah, when I'm, when I'm thinking about um, baseball and growing up, there, there's, a, there's a group of guys that are that are front and center who are a big part of that. That's so we, we go from there to, uh, Fordham and, um, 
you know, it's it's funny. I was when doing my research. You know, Wikipedia and and, and the internet can be a, a wonderful place. Uh, according to the internet, your net worth is two hundred and twenty million. <laughs> so I, I I did have to reach out. I re I reached out to Christy and I said, "You've been doing this for a while." I said, "Probably not as long as Jack did it with the Times." And I reached out to George Vesey to say, hey, "George, I mean, if if I mean, I know he's written three books, but I mean." Jack, Jack, Jack Curry's were 220 million, you know. So I, I, I took that as a grain of salt. But then I went, then no, I went Sean, on. Hold on, we, can we pause this interview? I, I need to have someone go park my 10 Rolls Royces, and maybe we should move this to my my summer cottage in the Cape Cod or my palatial estate. And I mean, gosh, that's funny. Or, you just or, made or, my or day have, with that. Have remark. your buddy Elon Musk join us. <laughs> um, so, so, and then I looked up the the. Uh, the list of famous um, Fordham alumni, Jack. We got to work on that. You didn't make the top forty. And I didn't make it. On that, now, that's granted, a lot part, of Fordham though. Is Michael K on there? He Michael, be. yeah, but Michael K was like thirty six or thirty seven. So I mean, wow. you know, we've got, but we've got Alan Alda, we've got Denzel Washington, we've got Vince Scully. There, there's a lot of big names. There's a lot of heavyweights on that. Yeah, Vince Scully was kind of Vince Scully was kind of lower down the, the list than I would have liked, um, considering he is actually. Let me get this right. He's the second cousin of my father's. Oh wow! Yes, and I had the pleasure of meeting him at the uh, in at the press box in in Dodger Stadium, and I had six million Yankee questions I want or Dodger questions I want to ask him, and he and my father were talking about herding chickens in 1936. <laughs> so I was like, Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it was awesome. It was pretty cool. But now here's the thing. So, so I mean, around that time that you were Fordham, I mean, there was, you know, there like it was kind of like a murderer's row. I mean, Syracuse gets the credit for being, you know, broadcasting, you know, sports media with all these guys that came out of Syracuse. But I mean, you were there. You mentioned Michael Kay was there. Bob Papa was there. Yeah. Mike Breen was there. Um, I know Joe Favorito, who went on and who went into public relations. He was there. Uh, John Giannone was a year John ahead Giannone. of me, who now works on the Ranger broadcast, does a terrific job with them. I, I think, Sean, the thing that Fordham did is it treated you like a professional from day one. If you passed all the tests you had to pass to get on the air, they didn't treat you like college kids. We were the ones broadcasting the games, producing the games. We had our own statisticians, our own research. We set up our own travel, and we had to go on the road to cover games. We covered outside sports, as they, as they do now. I see young men and women at Yankee Stadium with WFUV mic flags, and we all know this. It's in any walk of life. If you want to get better at something, you've got to do it. There, there has to be repetition, and you have to be around people who are better at it than you. You want to be a great basketball player don't play against your little brother play right. against your older brother so i think yeah. that's what fordham did for me and quick funny story you talk about the love of baseball when i went to fordham paul blair the former gold glove outfielder played with the orioles and the yankees was the head coach i actually went to one practice and it lasted about four and a half hours there were about 40 kids at the practice and they were going to keep 30 on the team i was pretty honest about my skill level I believe I would have made the 30, but I also believe I wouldn't have played. I would have been a bench guy. The practice took so long that by the time I got back to campus, all the food options were closed. And this is 1982. This isn't DoorDash days. So I missed dinner that night, and I decided I wasn't going back to the baseball practice anymore. The next day, I signed up for WFUV, the radio station, and I signed up for the RAM, the school newspaper. And though I missed playing baseball, I, I think I made the right choice. But like the thing is, from from talking to some of those guys that we just mentioned, you you were more interested in in writing, even though you know, I mean, you had like unlike myself and maybe Mister Fitzgerald, who have the perfect faces for radio. I mean, you you had the luck for TV, which I mean makes perfect sense now. But back then, you were more interested in right in print. One hundred percent. And Sean, in fact, to this day, even though I've been at the S Network for thirteen years. If you asked me what I do and who I am, in my heart of hearts, I, I consider myself a writer. And what I do at Yes is I'll, I'll take a bunch of notes and I'll have them with me. And, and that's my writing. And then I'm just transmitting my writing to the audience. I wanted to get a job in the sports journalism field. So 
when graduation time came at Fordham, I sent resumes to newspapers, magazines, radio stations, TV stations. I was always more comfortable in the written world. I thought I was going to end up in the written world. I just felt like it was a better fit for me. Not that I couldn't do the broadcast side of it, as I've proven now at this stage in my life, but I did feel more comfortable writing. And I think that's why I write books now. Since I'm at Yes and I'm 95% of my job there is broadcasting, I can fill that writing void by, by writing books on the side. And I, I still enjoy that tremendously. Um, uh, that's very cool. So, okay, so you graduate. Where, I mean, was the Times your first job? I worked at a small newspaper in Jersey City called the Jersey Journal for three summers after college. Sophomore Ed Lucas, junior. right? Say that again. That's where Ed Lucas was? Yes, I knew Ed Lucas. I've known Ed Lucas for a long time. And the Jersey Journal was owned by the star ledger they were new house publications so i was able to get a job at the star ledger in new jersey for about a year and that was a good starting place for a college graduate but where they had me slotted was local sports and i didn't see an avenue to grow much there they really took their local sports seriously high school college they still do they do a good job of it but i wanted to cover professional sports so I ended up getting a job at the Times 13 months, 13 months, about, about a year and a half after I graduated from Fordham. And I started at a low level. I didn't come roaring in as the Yankee beat writer. They had something called a writing program where they sort of put you on a path to being a reporter. But while you were doing that, you answered phones, you did research, you helped people who had to lay out the newspaper. Back then they were laying it out right in front of you. And it was, a, it was a grind, but I remember to this day, the first day I went into the New York Times, it was October 23rd, 1987. And when I walked through those revolving doors, I took a deep breath and I said to myself, do not, do not let them kick you out. Be good enough, be exceptional enough that they're going to want to keep you here. And Sean, it took about two and a half years, but in about two and a half years, they, they made me a reporter. I went from college sports to covering the NBA for a year, to finally getting to where I wanted in 1990, and that was that was to cover baseball. Very cool. Now, do you remember your first what your first interview was as the baseball writer? Wow, I do remember this because I tell kids this when I uh, when I speak to journalism students. You need to be prepared when you walk in that clubhouse, and I was. 25 and i will admit that i probably wasn't as prepared as i should have been i remember sean that i was with a former new york times writer who's since passed named joe durso and the first oh, game joe. i attended yeah, i remember joe i knew joe yeah. i didn't know joe, joe was passed. a really kind man uh, would look out for people and i was the sidebar guy for the day and there were two met players sitting by their lockers and I, again, I didn't know the dynamics of the clubhouse. First of all, when two players are having a conversation, you should probably wait on the outskirts a little bit. You probably shouldn't go roaring in. I interrupted their conversation. And then I said to the one player who had had three hits, must have felt great to have, have three hits today. And that is a no-no. First of all, there's no question in there. I, I, I made a statement. And the second player made fun of me and basically smacked me down verbally and made a big deal out of saying, well, no, he didn't want to have three hits. He was hoping he would strike out four times today. Great question. Where'd they get you from? And I, I'm not going to say the play, either of the players' names. It doesn't really matter. But I appreciate what the second guy did. He was right. I wasn't prepared. And Sean, from that day on, even though I thought I was this tough Jersey City kid who dealt with some stuff growing up, I got so much tougher after that. I, I was put in my place. And so that's the memory I have of, of being at a baseball game early that I kind of embarrassed myself and I vowed that I would never let that happen again. Uh, you know, it's funny. I just, I mean, obviously, you know, as you know, I mean, Christy's covering baseball now. She had a similar experience. Um, I mean, she got, she, she literally got the job as the Mets beat writer 
six days before spring training started so she had no no clue what to expect but uh she was in the uh she was in the mets clubhouse the first the first day of spring training and again lost not sure what what she's supposed to be doing and there's a guy in the corner um and he's staring at, he's like staring at her you know and finally eventually he walks up to her and he says hi um my name's travis darno and i'm new too oh wow and and that started a friendship that that has blossomed to this day you know i mean but that's i mean that's as you know i mean by being it's the it's those relationships that you you make and i mean that's what's the difference between being able to do what you do and not being able to do it you and the fact that you weren't able to do it as well during the uh, pandemic that's a fantastic story by the way travis starno just rose several notches in in my book i'm glad to hear that but i i've seen christy work at clubhouse sean and she's you can be very proud of her oh yeah oh very she's, very uh, much so she knows how to navigate a clubhouse and you're right it's about relationships it's about getting people to trust you and i remember again no one wants to hear pandemic stories, but I remember the first day being in Tampa when they told us that the clubhouse was going to be closed. Now the world, there, there were so a million more problems in the world, but that's, that's your heart and soul. That, that's your ability to have face-to-face -face interaction with players. Uh, that's your job. So again, I want to make sure I just emphasize this while the world had much bigger problems yeah. and all of us had much bigger problems. There was a part of me in my mind that says when, when baseball ever does return and if we don't have interaction with players, that, that's going to make this job a little trickier, a little, a little less fun. Because I've learned so many things, Sean, from just idle chit-chat in the clubhouse with players. I was talking to Mariano Rivera one spring training, and I used to love talking to Mariano because it was always, it was always more of a – he was preaching to you about whatever the topic was. And because we were moving along so well in the conversation, at one point, I think I asked him about his sons and his wife had just given birth in the off season. And it was a very complicated birth. And he started to get tears in his eyes and, and describing to me what had happened and how he was worried about his wife. He was worried about his, his son who was being born. And it was scary there. There, I mean, to, yeah. I wrote the story. It was, it was touch and go. And because he was so emotional about it, I asked him if he would let me write about the story. And he did. He allowed me to speak to the, the physician who had treated his wife. And Sean, that was all from five minutes of chit chat. And then just asking somebody how his family was. And he trusted me enough to tell me that story. You see, that's that's the problem is the most the fans don't realize that. I mean, OK, these guys get paid a gazillion dollars and they, they don't have maybe the same you know, worries that we do about, you know, everyday things because, you know, you're making a gazillion dollars, it's easy. But at the same time, they are human beings who have families who have to deal with stuff like that. And, you know, I mean, that's, you know, the, uh, like, you know, the one story that, I don't know if it ever really came out, but, you know, Edwin Diaz came to the Mets, right? And his first year with the Mets, he was not very good, you know, and everyone wanted to, to basically to, you know, run him out of town, you know, but most people didn't realize, as you all know, these guys are very, very close. A lot of the, the Hispanic guys are very close with their parents, but his mother uh, went through, uh, she had lung cancer and she had a lung removed, you know, and he was dealing with that as he's trying to pitch for the, for the Mets. But, you know, it, it, and he, in fairness, never made it an excuse, but, mm -hmm. you know, someone who I knew who was with Seattle came afterwards. I said, how, the, how could he be so good for Seattle? And so bad for the Mets. And he said, hey, this is what he went through, you know. But uh, let's let's liven things up a little bit. So now you mentioned the fact that, um, you know, you 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 get your the creative juices out by, by writing books. And if, Mar if I'm right, you have written three books now, correct? I wrote a book with Jeter that came out in 2000. I wrote a book. And that took 20 years off. I wrote a book with uh, Cone that came out in 19. And now this book with Paul O'Neill will be out later this month, uh, May 24th. Uh, we will get back to Mr. O'Neill. I have many bones to pick with him. But we'll, um, just so that you know, the your book uh, with Jeter um, was part of the impetus for the Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame. Oh, because um, his grand, his grand, great his grandfather, his mother's, his mother's father was Irish, and he credits in the book 
uh, getting his yeah work Sonny ethic. Connors yep right getting his work ethic from his Irish grandfather right his grandfather was a custodian at a parish in North Arlington I want to say it's Queen of Peace I don't have the uh, the book right in front of me right now Queen of and Peace Green- is always a good bet he wanted to go and uh, work with his grandfather one day and his grandfather gave him the chore the assignment of mowing the football field and Jeter said whatever he was 10 12 years old he'd never worked so hard in his life and he realized how hard his grandfather worked every day and as much as he loved his grandfather he didn't show up for grandson for work day anymore after that (laughs) so which is it fair to ask this question which was the easiest of those three guys to work with when it came to writing the book it's fair to ask that question And, and the way I answer that Sean is When I did that book with Jeter, Derek was 25 or 26 years old. I mean, gosh, he had he had his whole life ahead of him. I did the book with David again. I'm ballparking it here a couple years ago. He's mid 50s. His whole career has already happened. Um, He's had a couple of kids. He's been married. Paul O'Neill, same way. He's married. He's already got grandkids. So with Derek, I think we were capturing a, a snapshot of his life. With David. We were really trying to write the ultimate pitching book. I really wanted with David, because of his knowledge, to write a book that people 20 years from now would pick up and say, if you want to know about pitching and about a baseball life, buy this David Cohn book. And if I hope I don't sound arrogant in saying I I think we did that. I've, I've heard from a lot of pitching coaches and pitchers who have learned a lot from that book. And then with Paul, we were trying to do a very similar version of the David book, but do it in a more streamlined fashion. The Cone book took four years and is over 400 words. The O'Neill book took about a year and it's about 200 and I'm sorry, 400 pages, 400 words. That'll be quite a book. I was going to say, that's pretty good. You're using them over and over again. (laughs) The O'Neill book is about 240 pages. So I'm not really answering your question. Derek, Derek was a 25 year old when we did this book. So it was, it was catching him at the ballpark. It was catching him at a restaurant. It was, it was meeting him at his home. And- I, I, I always thought it was more, I mean, it's it's very good for younger kids to kind of s- see where he came from and how he got there. But I kind of was, it's it's more of what made him as opposed to what he was or, or where he came from. One, or it- 100%. And also, these books have been written for different audiences. When we wrote that book for Derek, about Derek, we were reaching for what they call the, the YA audience, the, the young adolescent audience. You wanted every 15, 16, heck, you wanted every 12-year-old kid to tell their mom and dad they wanted to buy that book. I didn't dumb it down. I I, I wrote the same way that I wrote at the New York Times, but I had to write it in Derek's voice. Right. And and I will tell you this. I I have three things that have made me very proud of all three of these books. When the Jeter book came out, both of his parents said to me, as I was reading that, I felt as if Derek had written it. Ed Cohn, David's father, said the same thing to me. And Neville O'Neill, Paul's wife, also read the book and, and really enjoyed it and, and loved Paul's voice in there. And Sean, Christie will tell you this, Steve Buckley, any of your other writing friends, it's not always easy to write in someone else's voice. You you really have to train yourself to, well, how, how would he say it here? And you, you want to dress it up a little bit be, because everybody speaks in a certain way, but... I, I'm happy that the people who are closest to the people that I've written about felt that their voice was prominent, as prominent as it was. So I, I mentioned just before we started that, you know, that when, when I heard you writing this book um, with, with Paul, I was excited for um, one of the main reasons why I was excited, because obviously this is pre-pandemic, was that I may have finally been able to get O'Neill to come to Foley's and accept his Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame plaque. Um, you know, he, we have tried. I know David has embarrassed him on the air. Michael Kay has embarrassed him on the air about why he wouldn't come. And, you know, I mean, as you know, he's kind of, a, can be kind of uncomfortable around crowds or almost shy, which is almost possible to consider that the warrior could be shy. Um, but you might find this funny. So, like I said, I spent, I, I kind of give up at this stage. I was like, you know what, you know, and, and 
I mean, even Flash was doing Flash was doing an event for me at Foley's, and I said, Flash, listen, will you just take this plaque? And, 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 and he's like, no, no. He's like, F him. He's like, he's going to come. He's going to pick it up himself. So fast forward about three or four years after we'd inducted him, I get invited to, um, uh, I think Brooklyn Brewery used to do this thing called uh, Dinner with a Legend. And uh, so you, it would be basically dinner, and then they would have a Q and A with with you know somebody famous, you know. And I had been to a couple of them. Lou Holtz was one, I think. Um, um, Lou Carnesecca was another one, um, and David actually David was, was no sorry Al Leiter was another one. And then I get invited to the Paul O'Neill one with my daughter, and Emma at the time would have been. 15 or 16 so we, she gets all she's all dressed up we go to the uh uh down no not the downtown athletic club the one that's up there by the by carnegie hall you know and we're at the pre-dinner reception and emma and i are standing there and i didn't realize but paul o'neill is standing behind emma and he's talking to some people and uh he he actually uh He's telling them how he's a member of the Irish American Baseball Hall of Fame. But finally, Emma says, Daddy, I have to do it. She ta Emma taps him on the shoulder and he says, Excuse me, Mr. O'Neill. And he's like, Yes. He's like, He's the guy who inducted you into the uh, Hall of Fame. And so he turns around and says, Oh my God, I'm so sorry. I'm sorry I haven't been there. So when I saw this book come out, I'm like, Perfect. Because if anybody can get him to come to Foley's, it'll be Jack Curry, especially if it's to sell some books. When when did he get inducted? How long oh, a period of time are we? So how long has this delay been? Oh, this has gone on a while. He went. He went in one of the first. I was going to look around. I think I actually hold on. I think he may actually have his plaque. <laughs> no, I, I, I think I have a funny story to tell Paul now. The next time I speak to him, I have I have Bill Murray's plaque, but I still have his plaque. It's not it's not going anywhere. So at some point we will get it to him. So I, I want you to let the people out there know. Uh, I mean, I know you have a couple of events coming up. Um, you know, we have obviously, if you let let uh, John or I know of the events, we will definitely do everything we can to post them. So, when uh, when is the book launch? Or when is when will it be? Is it available right now on the usual places? It is, Sean. Thanks, thanks for the opportunity to mention this. But if you go to paulonealbook.com right now, you can buy the book. You can choose who you want to buy it from: Amazon, Barnes and Noble. But that website will take you to pre-orders. And I always tell people, because sometimes with self-promotion, you want to almost hide in the corner. But pre-orders for an author are the best thing you can ever do. Because if the book is already generating some momentum before it's released, places like Amazon and Barnes & Noble, they're more likely to promote it and help get you even more sales. The book comes out on May 24th. I'm going to be at Yankee Stadium that day, and I'll talk to anybody and everyone who uh, is interested in the book. But I think the event you're referring to is I'm doing a book signing, not Paul. He's down in Florida. I want to make that clear. It's Jack Curry will be at Books and Greetings. It's in Northvale, New Jersey. So it's in northern Bergen County, but it's right over the Tappan Zee Bridge. May 26th, 6 p.m. Come out and talk some Yankees, talk some Paul O'Neill. I've got a lot of Paul O'Neill stories to tell. And if you have some questions about this 2022 Yankee team, I'm always willing to answer those as well. Hold on. You said O'Neill's in Florida? O'Neill is in Florida right now. Oh, I thought, I thought he was. I thought uh, maybe I'll track him down in Florida. It might be easier to find him in Florida. Get uh, that before, we go, <laughs> before we go, just when we're still on the topic of the book. Now, you've known O'Neill for a long time. You covered him and your time with him. Yes. Um, without giving too much away, can you tell us something that you learned doing the book that you didn't know? Yes. Thank you, Sean, for that opportunity. I just gave the nuts and bolts. I've known Paul for 30 years. And part of the reason I wanted to write this book was because of his passion as a hitter. I, I love to watch him hit. I, I, I love to watch his approach. I think that intensity that he had was pretty much unmatched by any other player that I ever covered. And I learned a lot about him and about hitting, Sean. I guess what stood out the most is just we probably knew he was stubborn as a hitter if you just watched his approach. But within that stubbornness, he always had a plan. And he stuck to his plan. He, he believed in hitting line drives, 
with his swing elevating upward at the end, kind of the way Ted Williams' swing was. He believed in always thinking fastball, and he wanted a pitch that was middle or away because he wanted to hit it to center field or left center. He could handle inside pitches, but his preference was to extend his, his bat and try and hit it the other way. And there's so many things in the book that I could cite, and I don't mind giving away a few things because that helps people become interested in the book. But we talk about his relationship with Pete Rose. We talk about how he clashed with Lou Pinella on hitting philosophy. He revered Mattingly, loved Mattingly. I don't think there's a player in baseball that he loved more than Don Mattingly. He watched the ascent of Derek Jeter and Mariano Rivera. One day out of the blue, Ted Williams called him and they had a conversation about hitting. So we did an entire That's chat. A great story. I've, I've heard him tell that story. That's a great story. His, his, his sister did, uh, set that up, right? His sister, Molly, who I also knew, was a food writer for the New York Times. And Ted Williams was a man of many talents and many interests, but he was a great fly fisherman and yeah. also would cook his own catch. So Molly went to write a feature on him under the guise of writing about food and fishing and a little baseball. But during the conversation, she mentioned how her brother had been struggling. And Ted Williams said, get him on the phone. So he called him during spring training. We, we did a whole chapter on that. Uh, his connection with Roberto Clemente. He wore 21 his whole career, which he sort of was given just inadvertently when he was with the Reds. But it actually goes all the way back to his childhood. And the first game he ever attended at Crosley Field with the Reds, his father has him posed for a picture his dad was sharp enough to make sure Roberto Clemente was in the background of the picture. So, I mean, think about that. A Cincinnati kid goes to a game. His baseball fan father makes sure he gets Clemente in the picture. The kid grows up, wears 21 his whole career, and then gets his number retired. So just a lot of fun anecdotes and fun hitting stories like that are in the book. And, and of course, he is um, he's a direct descendant of Mark Twain also, right? Yes, that is true. Yes. You did your research, Sean. No, no, no. Well, about... well, here, as I told people from my years of bartending, I'm a well of useless pieces of information. <laughs> he know, also for... he talks about being called the warrior. And yeah. I don't know if people know this, but this is something that's in the book. He didn't like that at the beginning. No. He, he, he didn't he like when it. George Steinbrenner called him the warrior. He he thought it almost had a little cartoonish element to it. And why is he giving me a nickname? Is not my play enough? Why do I need a nickname? And then he grew to really understand that that was about as high a compliment as, as George Steinbrenner could pay someone. Plus, I've also heard he's really not that good on the drums. <laughs> I saw him play. Coney, were you at this, Sean? Coney had a 20-year anniversary of his perfect game. Yeah, yeah. And I, 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 I sponsored it, but I wasn't at it. I was... Paul Simon, Bernie Williams, Paul yeah. played the drums. Paul was pretty... Paul kept the beat. I mean, you got to... They always say if you don't have a drummer, you don't have a rock band. So I, I thought Paul did a pretty good job. So now, but before we finish, when you about... mention music, you're a big music guy, I believe. I love music. I I'm much more apt to listen to music than I would to listen to sports radio. There were times when I was traveling with the Yankees, Sean, and even though I work in TV now, and maybe I shouldn't say this, I could spend three days in a hotel room and never turn the television on. Because I just listen to music. I, 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 when I run, I listen to music. That's my salvation. That's if I wasn't covering baseball, I think I would have tried to figure out a way to have a, a career in music. Now, do you have a particular preference of of genre of music? Growing up in the seventies, the the genre that hit me the hardest and that I've tried to stick with, I was a new wave punk rock guy, and that has graduated to now it'd probably be called alternative rock. So what I try and do is just listen to bands that I like today are bands that sounded like the bands I liked in the past. So if I liked the Clash, the Ramones, the B-52s, the Smiths, Talking Heads, today I'm trying to listen to the bands that sound the most to me like them. So I found it strange to find out that you're a huge fan of Dale Watson. I do. I met Dale Watson. Um, in Nashville during the winter meetings once. I was with Bob Lorenz and Meredith Morakovitz. How did you know that? I did my research. Really? You're going to, as a member of the media, you're going to ask me to reveal my sources? He, uh, he was such a nice guy. And I'm, I'm somewhat embarrassed to say that before that day, I had never heard of him. 
And afterwards, I went and did a little research on his music. And Sean, he he is this guy is a throwback in time. He he could have been hanging out with Johnny Cash, oh yeah, Earl Haggard, and Waylon Jennings. That's who he sings like. And if you get a chance, it's not that long of a movie. He actually stars in a movie called uh, Yellow Rose. And it's about a young girl who, uh, I don't want to give too much away, but it's about a young girl who has a lot of struggles in life. And he sort of helps her find her, her musical place in life. Really, really good movie. It's probably only ninety minutes, and you, you could find it somewhere. I don't know if it's on I'll, Netflix. I'll find it. Yeah, I, 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 I was listening to some of his stuff last night. You know, live when I drink, and the bottle never let me down. And uh, you know, he's, he's, uh, it's, uh, it's. My well, baby, I'm, I'm a big my country baby makes me gravy. Me, me it was, <laughs> you know, I, when I heard that you were a fan of country, I was like, wow. I'm like, just, that's I love, I love Johnny Cash. Uh, my, my mom and dad listened to that growing up, so that, that's always. I, I like older. Older country. That that was something I would be more inclined to listen to. When it when when it was when it was country. Not you know the, the last time I went to a country uh, co- country uh, song. It was, a lot of concerts they didn't have a fiddle on the stage. I'm like that's it. I'm out. Jack, listen, <laughs> we have to run. This has been absolutely awesome. I wish you nothing but uh, continued success with the book. Um, again, if there's you know we'll, we will let the members know of up and coming events when you have them. Um, I wish you luck with the Yankees. Um, like I said, you tell Mr. O'Neill that you know I still have his plaque, and if 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 he doesn't come, in, if he doesn't let me give it to him soon, um, basically I'm going to hang it around my neck and wear it during spring training next year. Um, thank you. Uh, this has been cracking the bat by the Irish American Baseball Society. Uh, on behalf of myself and John Fitzpatrick, we again thank you, Jack Curry, for doing this, and uh, look forward to seeing you soon.